get started. Um, so my name is Don Lo Chang. I'm the uh, city traffic engineer for um, City of Seattle. I've been with Seattle for a little over two years now. And prior to that, um, I worked in City of Everett. Um, and prior to that, I worked uh, in State DOT as a traffic engineer. So it's been about 23 years in the profession. And um, uh, uh, I would say that the last two years have been the most fulfilling and rewarding um, part of my profession. And that I hope to uh, maintain this uh, level of uh, satisfaction on my job. This is incredible. Um, so, and I wanted to share with you some of the things that I've learned uh, uh, um, through these 23 years. And it's just evolving. I'm just learning so much from listening to the community and how, uh, how uh, our environment, physical environment, affects people and how they interact with each other. Um, so it is very, um, I have a lot of slides in here, so I'm going to go through real fast. But uh, if you have any questions, please stop uh, and, and ask, ask me uh, uh, so that I can answer your questions. Um, and then towards the back is where sort of the meat of the, the presentation is, and I apologize, it's not in the front. Um, so uh, this is a uh, session on designing streets for, uh, to enhance community. Um, so uh, uh, Seattle Department of Transportation mission uh, is to uh, deliver first-rate transportation system for Seattle. And our vision is to have a vibrant Seattle with connected people, uh, places, and products. And we have five values. Uh, we want to keep it safe. So we want to engineer and educate and enforce and evaluate all of our uh, transportation ne network. We want to focus on the basics, um, which is to maintain and protect and preserve and enhance our capital assets. So these are things that you know that are out there, like our roads or sidewalks. Make sure that we're keeping them in good repair. Um, we want to build healthy communities and support sustainable, uh, livable, and equitable growth. And we want to support a thriving economy to keep people and goods moving and keep great places that attract, uh, create, <laughs> create great places that attract uh, uh, businesses. So, um, you know, it's really all about safety, and it's about our uh, most vulnerable users. Um, and we do things to try to uh, provide uh, the environment that uh, can um, allow a child like this to um, learn how to ride a trike, uh, learn how to ride a bike, without having to drive, hopefully, uh, to a park, to a playground that is, you know, within a, uh, a location that's fairly close, um, so that it's accessible. Um, and I have two young kids right now, and right now I don't have this environment in, in, in my community. Uh, so uh, we walk our bike to a location and we uh, uh, learn, and then we use our residential streets to get to places. Um, so uh, it's a, a built environment, obviously, and so uh, as, as we get resources, uh, we're building uh, uh, the network to get them to school as they're uh, uh, getting into the elementary school. Uh, community is telling me that you know they want safe streets and routes to the, uh, the destinations that uh, they, want, uh, they want to visit. So um, there's a viaduct, you know, so what a beautiful facility. We all enjoy it when we're, when we're all in a car, but it's a different experience if you get to experience it uh, on a marathon. I don't know if you ever got to walk on that uh, on the St. Patrick's Day uh, or uh, yeah, on, on these uh, uh, marvelous events that we have that opens up our transportation network. So I met my wife. Uh, when we rollerbladed uh, down uh, the express, uh, express lanes, the river swell lanes on I-5 from Northgate to downtown and back. And uh, <laughs> that was, you know, uh, you know, totally geeky thing, but uh, um, it was a, a transformative uh, experience. You know, I got, I got to meet my soulmate there. <laughs> uh, so I want to give you a brief, uh, brief overview. I want to show you some of the things that are really uh, changing our community um, and the face of our city. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously uh, there's some transportation projects that are affecting our region. Um, what are our strategies for managing some of these uh, so that it's safe and that people can get around and that, you know, we, that we really have a, a quality of life here? And then provide some illustration of some design uh, that, uh, that we can put into practice. So, as you know, uh, if you look downtown, you know, there, there is a tremendous amount of uh, uh, growth. Uh, a lot of developments are happening. A lot of uh, uh, um, pent up demand, uh, not just in downtown though, if you look at you know, West Seattle, uh, Ballard, all of our uh, urban growth centers are uh, experiencing the same growth. And 
it's a huge amount of investment. We haven't seen this uh, level of uh, investment in our history, so uh, it is a transformative time for us. And everybody's questioning, how are we going to get around, right? So with all these uh, new residents and jobs that are coming in uh, and things are quite bad, um, how are we going to accommodate all that? And if you see the, uh, uh, this is from Downtown Seattle Association's uh, report, um, it's showing this uh, uh, pretty dramatic decline on the recession of condos and apartments. And then the economy turns around and you know, a, a lot of the developers who have a lot of equity in these developments um, are unloading their building to get out. <laughs> and so we see this spike in apartment uh, uh, construction downtown and other locations. Um, obviously, uh, because of the mortgage market, uh, the condo uh, demand isn't as, as high. And so that's where all the investments are going in right now, is the, the, the towers uh, that you're seeing. And what are the state to support all these new people that want to live in, <laughs> live in these buildings? Um, so you know, you can see that uh, the job growth. You know, they uh, there was a little bit of um, decline, but now it's picking back up. You know, uh, about the pre-recession level, right? So, uh, um, and obviously, uh, we are uh, far ahead of uh, the med uh, many of our other uh, areas in our region in our job job growth, uh, Seattle. It has been very fortunate in terms of our uh, recovery. And some of our, what, you know, who are some of our largest employers downtown? Because that's where a lot of our, half of our uh, job base is uh, located. Um, Amazon has uh, decided to locate their headquarters. So if you look down in South Lake Union, um, all of that uh, hustle and bustle and development is to accommodate their headquarters and all their uh, workers. Um, and it has transformed that entire neighborhood down there. If you go uh, during lunchtime, it is a mass of people. Um, it's incredibly vibrant, uh, much different than what uh, what we remember in the low rise, uh, a lot of manufacturing, a little bit of a, uh, retail, but now just a, 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 a huge uh, employment base and also residential. Um, we also have Starbucks, Expeditors, who is a shipper. Nordstrom's and Meredith, uh, is, so those are the largest employers uh, in downtown uh, Seattle. And we have a lot of public investments. So this is the uh, public uh, uh, sector uh, housing in the Yesler Terrace. Um, there is a uh, streetcar uh, that will be opening up later this year uh, that will connect from Capitol Hill down to Pioneer Square. And um, that is spurring on some development in Yesler Terrace where um, Public housing is now being uh, developed uh, with uh, the private uh, company who is uh, Vulcan. They're the contractor that's building the first stage of that development. And there's and these are just three examples, but uh, large, large uh, towers that are um, under construction and also uh, being uh, uh, being permitted. And so it's a it's a, uh, uh, a paradigm where. How do we get all these people who are um, expected to uh, reside and live uh, and work in these buildings? You know, these are uh, Columbia Towers uh, times you know several magnitude all throughout the city in the downtown area. And of course, uh, we have, as you know, uh, a lot of large uh, regional project, which is uh, we're replacing the uh, the vulnerable viaduct where, uh, with a tunnel, which. Uh, has a lot of the construction down on the south end, um, uh, mostly finished on the surface street, but it has stalled, uh, um, uh, and so we're hoping that it'll get going again. Um, <laughs> and also, uh, we uh, we have a uh, very generous uh, uh, vote by the uh, city uh, city residents to replace a seawall that will make our waterfront safe again. Uh, so you know, the, uh, really large construction that's uh, going to be happening. Uh, in our waterfront in the south portal. Um, of course, our uh, waterfront, uh, the vision is that it's going to uh, open up our front porch to, uh, uh, to the water and uh, be an inviting place for the community. Uh, Mercer corridor, uh, the east corridor is pretty much done. If you go out there, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a changed uh, street. It used to be a mass of cars, and now it's, uh, it's a street that has a mass of cars and also uh, lots of uh, amenities for pedestrians. So there's a lot of uh, pedestrian activity in that area. And these are all happening uh, right around the same time. So all this construction is happening at the same time. So uh, you know that's my challenge as a city traffic engineer is like, how do we manage all this? 
Um, you know, the 520 is a, is a, is a, uh, a program that's replacing a floating concrete uh, uh, roadway um, with a new floating concrete roadway, and so uh, they did some early tolling to uh, get that financing. That tolling to pay to go across the, br uh, the bridge has changed some of the traffic patterns. And so uh, we're seeing that within the city as well. Question. On the 520, um, is there a provision um, for uh, not just HOV, but for uh, light rail and so forth? So they have designed the pontoons to uh, eventually handle a light rail, but it is not built into the project. Mm -hmm. So uh, they uh, uh, have accommodated a future uh, light rail uh, if, if, uh, if that investment is made which is, I think, a, a good investment, hopefully, in the future. And of course, uh, we really rely on uh, transit for uh, the heavy lifting. So uh, we have uh, the Link Light Rail uh, will open up in New District in, uh, next year. It's going to be a huge game changer for us. If you think about all the, uh, 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 the commute pattern that happens in New District with the buses, now they'll get replaced with this really high quality service uh, uh, light rail system uh, that comes right to downtown. So those buses uh, now no longer need to come uh, into downtown. We, we have the capacity now to serve uh, beyond the, the Montley cut. <laughs> the, so uh, uh, getting through that, uh, uh, the water feature uh, will be uh, uh, available next year. So, um, and then of course, uh, we are uh, building out our first Hill Street car that will be in place uh, uh, later this fall. Uh, we have the uh, uh, North Link, uh, which is going to North uh, 2021 and uh, serving Bellevue and to the East in 2023. So these are a long time frame, but if you think about it, it will come very quick. And our political system is not really helping our situation either. Nationally, uh, uh, our transportation funding is broken. Uh, our transportation funding is uh, based on user fees, so your gas tax, if you use your vehicles, um, that pays for the maintenance and new capital projects. So we built a paradigm where our infrastructure is dependent on people driving and driving more and more and more in order to fund and maintain. And our infrastructure is older and it's getting uh, uh, to the point where we have to replace our interstates. Um, so it is not sustainable and it is not a model that will work. Um, we also see that happening within our own, uh, own state uh, where our uh, our legislatures are struggling with the same uh, same paradigm. One thing good is that in Seattle, uh, the voters have uh, approved the levy, which is called the Bridge in the Gap. It's a property tax levy uh, that pretty much maintains some uh, steady funding to maintain our uh, 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 infrastructure. So uh, you know there there is some progressive thinking within uh, within Seattle. Isn't steady an overstatement? It has to be renewed, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, so it's a nine-year levy, and it'll uh, end in 2015. There's a oversight committee uh, that will uh, let us know how the department has done in terms of fulfilling our commitment to the voters. Um, there was some specific things that, that we promised to do, and so we'll be graded upon that, and, uh, and then hopefully uh, we'll um, get a favorable uh, opinion after we're all done. So. Um, Early 2000s, you know, uh, there was a Access Seattle study that said, you know, we're going to have, you know, uh, uh, 27,000 new uh, uh, jobs in, in downtown. How are we going to accommodate it? You know, that's, you know, say it's 27,000 new cars that are coming in. Um, we'll have to have that many parking spaces. So uh, let's build a $750 million parking um, uh, uh, facility to handle that. That's, that'll require about 20 city blocks, and uh, each of them would require a 10 story parking garage. <laughs> and in order to accommodate those vehicles, we have to have two, uh, 12 lanes of uh, uh, additional uh, traffic capacity. Not a, a something that we can <laughs> we can have, right? So uh, it's a uh, so uh, we uh, we made this uh, uh, goal. So like, you know, what what do we need to do to get there? So we you know we had this most split in order to get there, and so um, uh, we had to change how uh, people arrive downtown in order to not uh, inundate uh, the downtown surface streets. And uh, guess what? Uh, you know, it's very clear. You know, we can. Uh, it's a matter of just the you know, space. You could have you know 200 cars uh, in that amount of space, or you can have three buses. Um, doesn't take up that much space. You can put it on that uh, bus lane, right? So they, they go through it pretty quick. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have uh, some other uh, people who want, who want to go through without uh, traveling long distance on a bicycle, maybe. Uh, people would definitely walk on the nice sidewalks. 
uh, one light rail, so uh, multiple, but you know, really tells us that we have to think about all different options, right? We have to accommodate the, the cars, we have to accommodate more buses because that's the most efficient way to uh, carry people through. And then there's also a need to make sure that our pedestrian, because once you come downtown, you're walking, and so we got to make sure that people can get around. So those are the challenges, and uh, people have uh, really responded. Um, so uh, we have only 34 percent of the people coming arriving downtown by single occupant cars. That's dramatic. Um, majority of the people get to downtown by uh, taking transit, uh, and some people are taking uh, uh, carpool and vanpool. Nine percent. Um, a lot of people walking and live in downtown, and uh, uh, a a uh, portion that uh, bike, I bike uh, myself uh, to downtown every day uh, from home. So, uh, and the fastest growing mode is transit. And um, obviously, you know, that's, that's the, the, the most efficient way to get people. Uh, and just a clarification on that, that's, that's commuter breakdown. It doesn't exactly. Talk about weekends getting to a recreation play. Correct, correct, correct. So these are daily activities uh, during, uh, during the weekday. And let's take a look at the region and why is this so important? Well, if you look at the employment base, Seattle has almost 200,000 in that small space. And if you look at the east side, look how big that land mass is. You know, that's a, that's a lot of resources in order to get the people around. So uh, it's really important for us as, uh, as a community, as a nation, to think about keeping sustainability. How do we make sure that we can conserve resources so that our next generation uh, can benefit uh, from the same prosperity that we have. Um, and people in, in, uh, in our region have responded. I mean, the city of Seattle, uh, people are driving less. I mean, it's a steadily declining uh, volume of traffic in, in Seattle. We are one of five in the nation um, that have uh, uh, less than 50% of the dri uh, people driving to work. So, and this is, if you look at some of these uh, other queer cities, Boston, they have you know a, a very good rail service, uh, a subway system. Uh, New York, my gosh, you know that's <laughs> the, the premier. Uh, DC definitely have the, they have their metro. Um, San Francisco, they have their BART. Uh, but us, what do we have? <laughs> we have the link light rail that's starting to to really pay dividends. You're you're seeing that ridership where we have a streetcar um, that's exceeding uh, ridership. But primarily, our heavy lifting is by buses. I mean, that's 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 what that's the story. The metro buses and the community transit buses, all the buses that are carrying uh, people around, they're carrying most of our uh, load. So uh, here's an example. You know, I like to use data to show you uh, how, you know, real life. So when I came to work for uh, City of Seattle in uh, February 2012. This is one of the first projects that uh, uh, we embarked on. So Aurora, you guys all know Aurora, right? Highway 99 comes down uh, from all the way from the Canadian border down. So uh, from the uh, Aurora Bridge uh, down to Denny, uh, which is downtown, uh, we were anticipating the construction of the uh, Mercer uh, corridor. So we were going to um, uh, change the lane configuration to lane each direction. So we said, you know, we really had to be smart about this and make sure that people can get through. And so we did an earlier implementation and put in a bus lane to get people into town. So coming into town is sort of the, uh, the big challenge, right? And so we took one of the three lanes and made it into a 24-hour bus lane from the bridge all the way down to Denny. Huge amount of opposition. A lot of letters, uh, a lot of phone calls. I went to a lot of community meetings uh, and a lot of vehemence and anger um, that we did this. And, uh, uh, what we did is said, you know, we're going to show you why we did this. And so uh, uh, Charlie Bookman, who was the uh, person that hired me, uh, part of the, he retired after, shortly after he hired me, uh, and uh, said, you need to show me the data. I said, you know, it's like uh, I don't understand why you did why you did this. And I showed him the data. I said, hey, look, okay. So we have a counter um, right here, uh, right by right by the bridge, and uh, we took. So it was implemented. Um, on uh, June 25th, right? So uh, we took uh, a week before, um, and we have a counter that counts all the uh, traffic and the volumes. Um, and uh, a week before, there was 43,000 vehicles on that stretch. Uh, it was average speed of 26 miles per hour. In the peak hour, we had six, uh, 865 cars, and the average volume in that peak, or uh, average speed in that peak was uh, 47. Afterwards, we're carrying, you know, just a little bit less. The speed is about the same. 
carrying a little less during the during the peak because you know, we uh, clamped the capacity down. Speed is a little bit higher. That's kind of weird, huh, right? Okay, so what is that one single lane of bus taking? Well, let's see. Uh, that route serves these uh, 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 bus routes. Yeah, so Metro uh, Route 5, 16, 26, 28, 358. 30,000 riders on that, uh, on that corridor. Uh, so we're, we're carrying 43,000 single occupant cars, 30,000 people on the buses. So during the critical time, 830, 7.30 to 8.30, we, get, we have 30 southbound bus trips. So these are the express trips, right? So 5, 5 Express, 16, 26 Express, 28 Express, 358 Express. We're carrying 1,500 riders on that, on that single lane with 30 buses. So people say, it's always empty. Well, 30 buses in an hour, you're not going to see many buses, right? But we're carrying 1,500 riders versus 865 and 822 people. So we're carrying more people on that single lane than we are carrying on all the two, uh, two lanes. So we asked the question um, to my bosses, Charlie, if we, if we take 10%, 20% of those riders, and we stick it so that they, you know, they're delayed, so they get on their, their car and drive, you know what happens to this, uh, this speed? It's at the bottom of capacity level right there, and it's going to start declining very rapidly. And so you would suffer because of it. And everybody understood it. And they said, well, in a year from now, you know what's going to happen? It's going to actually even worse. So would it make sense to improve service, we get more people so that you can actually uh, drive to there rather than having people with gridlock and having buses gridlock? And we all got it. Uh, so we have the community now in support. But the reason why is because we have the data. You know, we have, so I, as a, uh, uh, a servant for you, I have to get this data, make it so that it's understandable, so that you can, uh, you can really understand why we're doing it. Here's another independent analysis. So this Enrix, uh, uh, it's a Bellevue company that does a national scorecard. Uh, they, they, they say, you know, which is the most congested um, uh, uh, metropolitan area in the, uh, in the United States. Well, we have data from Enrix. Uh, they use probe data. So your cell phones, you have, you have, so you have an iPhone, you know kind of you know, where you are, right, with the GPS. Well, they, they use that. They use the Ford. They use BMW. Uh, they have probe data uh, from all these uh, sources. And they can tell us from this point to this point what the average travel speed is. So this is before, and you can see that you know it gets down around uh, six, uh, seven to eight o'clock, a little bit slower, about forty, and then goes back up again. And the evening goes back to forty. Afterwards, this is a month worth of data before and one worth of data after for every Wednesday. Um, so this is afterwards, and you can see uh, that, that there's actually a slower travel all the way through here. So we took a measurement on this data right here, and we took a measurement for the entire corridor. So this is the difference. Seven miles per hour in that corridor, that's, that's your difference. Three miles per hour in the evening. So it's very compel compelling that you know, it was a worthwhile investment, the impact really wasn't all that significant. People's perception is that that empty lane, I can use it, but if I use it, it's going to get a lot worse. So what we, you know, it, it just helps us um, make, you know, make the case for transit and why it's so important. And you know, some of the things that we do, uh, very uh, subtle, but we do things like queue jump, where uh, the buses uh, uh, will pick up passengers and they'll get an early green so they can get through the intersection and merge on to where they need to go saves them a long time because if you have cars that are uh, trying to um, get in front of the buses, um, if you think about how many people are in here versus five or six cars that are getting in front, huge impact. So if they could get through there, much safer, and they get to uh, get, get the uh, most amount of people to that intersection. Uh, we have uh, uh, one bus away for that display. <laughs> Amazing. Someone, someone from the University of Washington developed that application using the data that Metro had and uh, published it so that you can have it on your uh, mobile device. We put it out on the uh, uh, out of the bus stop so you can see if you missed your bus. Um, changes the experience for you. Did I miss that bus? Well, do you know now, right? Um, and of course, we want to make sure that everything works uh, well, and so we monitor the traffic. We tell people how uh, things uh, are operating. With there's a big uh, uh, collision, we'll let uh, we'll let uh, uh, the drivers know and the buses know. Um, with uh, dynamic message signs, uh, we also have tweets, you know, and we just use all the tools that's available for us. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, traffic cameras that feed the information so that you can have it out at your desk. 
Uh, you can see the congestion. This is actually available for you right now if you wanted to go to our website and see what that uh, what the traffic is. You might say, I, I think I'll wait five minutes or ten minutes or maybe just have dinner before I uh, contribute to that data. You know, so that is tremendous in terms of giving you the information and then you can make, decide for yourself. Um, the investment for this little camera is not very much, right? But uh, the value that it provides, 24 hours a day, right? So, uh, and it is not just the commuters, it's for a fire, it's for a uh, uh, police, um, it, it's available for the, for the entire public. Um, and of course, what we really want to do is that target zero. We want zero fatality and serious injury uh, 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 within, before I retire. <laughs> so we're on a pretty good trend line in terms of, uh, of uh, reducing uh, that. Um, and I want to talk to you about how we can get there. Um, the big thing is speed. So um, it's our most vulnerable users and yourselves and your, and your vehicles. That speed contributes to the survivability. Uh, um, so if you are going 40 miles per hour and you uh, run into a person, um, that person won't survive. Nine out of time, uh, 10 times that person will, uh, will not survive. 30 miles per hour, 10 miles less, uh, it's 50-50. So it's a little bit better, right? If it's 20 miles far, definitely that person will just, you know, they'll definitely be hurt, but they won't be killed. So that speed differential, especially at locations where there's a lot of pedestrians, a lot of uh, people who are uh, vulnerable, uh, we want to make sure that we uh, uh, provide the safest environment for you as a driver and for you as a uh, person who's walking on the street. Excuse me, do you have any statistics on disabilities, like long-term disabilities, as a result of so I don't, but uh, Dr. Beth Evil from Harvard Medical uh, Center does. Um, she's working with us and uh, uh, University of Washington. Um, uh, there is a, uh, a regional consor consortium of uh, universities to look at this exact. You know, the, there's a lot of uh, distractive, uh, distractive driving that's happening now. Um, so when you are texting or talking on your phone, uh, your impairment level is like seven times being legally drunk. So that you know, you know. So the, she is very concerned about the societal uh, uh, nuisance, or uh, I can't remember the exact word that she uh, she phrased it. But I mean, it is what it, you know. It is an addiction for us when we're in the car and that phone vibrates. People pick it up autom automatically, and that is a behavior that we have to stop. You know, uh, instantly because it is uh, it is a uh, a tragedy that's you know just waiting to happen. Uh, people just you know realize. We're all smart people, we're educated, you know, but, you know, uh, I find myself, myself doing it. And now, um, whenever I, uh, I am commuting, so on my bike, actually, I don't have my phone with me. Because sometimes I find myself reaching for my phone while I'm riding my bike. I mean, this is, it, was, it was that level. Yeah, and, you know, I myself, I have two little small kids. No way would I ever want to be not around for them. I was wondering about the, just the disabilities, how, like, what percentage of people who survive those, those collisions uh, end up disabled in that level. I mean, that would be an interesting information as well. Yes. Uh, I think the, the, the biggest, uh, um, the, the, Dr. Beth Abel will have, have that information. I think that the uh, uh, brain injury tends to be the most severe. Um, so I know the, um, uh, the collision that happened in uh, Wedgwood uh, last year, um, you know, the consequences were to fatality and uh, two very severely uh, injured individuals, you know, and it's going to be a lifetime of disability for them. So, you know, we, Seattle has a complete street ordinance, you know, and, you know, we uh, very focusedly, every project that we do, uh, are looking at this to make sure that we are looking out for the safety for all users, for all of our programs. So, you know, anything that we do, uh, we have that in our DNA. Um, this road is very typical in Seattle, four lanes, right? Um, sidewalks, you know, it looks pretty good, right? Um, imagine yourself trying to cross that. It's pretty darn daunting. This is not too bad, but as the traffic gets a little bit heavier, you probably wouldn't want to cross that, right? So uh, um, it becomes a barrier for community. To, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a wall uh, that you can't cross to get to the school, get to the parks, uh, get to the grocery store. Um, and how do we change that? So we look at um, how does it really function? You know, do we need that capacity? And just the reconfiguration couldn't have a significant difference. The reason why this may work very well in your, in your uh, experience, but it doesn't in reality, is because if someone is making a left, they might 
go to the right and pass them. If someone's making a right and you're behind them, you might make the left, right? So there's all this friction that happens. People are sorting back and forth. And our data shows that it has a high number of collisions and they tend to be very severe. It encourages very uh, abrupt behavior. Um, Head-on collisions occur, uh, angle collisions occur. Um, and we have very regimented and documented and uh, a rigorous process to evaluate whether we can do this treatment to make it much safer and be more efficient than that, uh, that treatment that you saw. So in here, we just, uh, we, uh, we just painted the, the lanes differently. So we put in a left turn, a two-way left turn lane, we made it one lane each direction, so that if you're making a left turn, now you don't have to worry about someone behind you, uh, rear-ending you, and trying to rush to make that left turn onto the side street of the driveway, and not seeing that pedestrian trying to cross. So cars are not allowed to park on the side here? On here, no. So the other, so here, um, sorry. Okay. Here, um, we had two lanes in each direction, right? So okay. people were going. Here, we just reconfigured it. Uh, you can do it differently. You can put parking on one side. Uh, you can put parking on both sides. You can really narrow it down. So, uh, you can make a one lane each direction, too. So many different ways. It just depends on your turning volumes uh, and whether you have a lot of pedestrians that are crossing. So if you do that, um, you know, obviously, uh, uh, it's much easier, I'm sorry, easier for you to cross because now you just have to uh, negotiate one lane at a time. Boom, you're right here. You still feel a little vulnerable, but much, much better than before, a two-step crossing, right? But if we do something like this, now it's much easier, you know, so if I have a child with me, I wouldn't feel too bad trying to cross here. Um, if I had a signal there, definitely I wouldn't have any problems, right? Um, and what's the behavior of the drivers? They're looking out for, now we got this marked crosswalk, you're looking out as a driver, it's like, oh, I'm not in this, you know, in this very fast-paced roadway anymore. I'm looking for bicycles, I'm looking for people uh, walking along, I'm looking for people crossing. So it's the well, I, was, I was walking yesterday and I witnessed an accident right in front of me uh -huh. on um, 35th Ave, which, is, uh, which has a bike lane. Yes. And then two lanes, of course, one this way and that way. And someone was pulling out of the driveway because they allowed parking on the side and you can't see. You can't see, exactly. You can't see. Yeah. And I was 10 feet in front of me. And I saw, and, and so someone pulled out. But it's also a bike lane. I mean, it could have been a bicycle and two cars instead of just two cars. It was just kind of, it just happened so quickly and such, but when people only allow parking on those streets that have bike lanes and only one lane, mm -hmm. it's very difficult for folks that live there to be able to, to pull, pull in there safely. Yes. I know, I know you guys know that, but yes. I'm just kind of wondering when they're, when anything's going to happen to some of those streets that are we're, just like that. We're, we're taking those on. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a part, of, part of our program to cool. make sure that, that we address the safety yeah. issues. I have so a question, it, um, yes. a question about that built to the park. I know this is not a workshop, but um, real quick, uh, what's happening with a lot of the zoning is that they're reducing um, the amount of uh, parking that has to be provided on, under or with like multifamily townhouses and so forth. And the idea is that people drive less, but in fact they don't. And so what happens in a lot of the neighborhoods is that then people park on the street and then you get just that phenomenon. Yeah. So my, my question to you as a SDOT representative is, how are you working with D DPD to, to reconcile that? We're actually working fairly well together. Um, the reason why I love working for the city uh, rather than for the state DOT was that uh, 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 I felt like I was contributing to the detriment of human humanity. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I felt really bad. I, I was creating communities where uh, you would age and then at a certain point when you can't drive, you can't live in that community anymore. Um, because it was a bedroom community that was separated by this massive high highway, and that you didn't have the services. That, uh, so if you weren't able to, if you were disabled, if you didn't, weren't, didn't have the mobility, now you were pretty much uh, isolated from your your uh, your, your support network. Um, and that was a paradigm where people were driving two three hours back and forth. I mean that's time wasted. You know that's resource wasted. A lot of stress. Um, and I was chasing that to. You know, back and forth. I mean, as as the, the unincorporated areas develop with uh, with these housing developments, it was it was happening over and over again. Um, the reason why I love my job now is because we're talking to you. I talk to the people that can actually make a difference. We're actually talking about zoning codes. We're talking about you know things that could happen on the streets. So when the development comes in, that we have the right <coughs> mechanism in place so that if you choose to. You, ha you have the ability to live without a vehicle. You have the ability to get around. Uh, 
So we have these urban centers that have the mass transit system. But what we don't currently have is a mature mass transit system. That's why you're, that's why you're, that's why you're asking. Yeah. As we develop these high, uh, high density neighborhoods with the zoning, the uh, pressure is as a developer, you want to develop as maximum as possible, right? Mm. And so, and they rather not pay for the structured parking because it's very expensive. And so, uh, uh, you know, we are seeing kind of the economics happening where um, there is some pressure for people to, uh, uh, without, without the means to be able to afford something like that, but then we don't have the ability for us to provide the transit service in order to support that. So we, we're, we're sort of in that paradigm where uh, we need to, as a society, talk about how do we get the transit system so that it supports that, where we don't have to worry about people uh, uh, parking and creating, create, uh, creating this uh, negative consequence in, in the neighborhood. How do we create a, 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 uh, a community? So it's a, it's a great point. I'm, I hear you. I'm working with DPD. Uh, work, I talk with them all the time. Uh, uh, it is it is something that we are very cognizant of, and we're you know, city does not have a transit uh, mandate. We don't have ability to affect transit, but we do fund transit. We uh, we fund transit hours. We fund uh, improvements on the transit stops. We fund uh, how transit get, gets around by providing transit lanes. So that's you know I have that ability as a uh, uh, as uh, as a representative uh, who works for the community. Um, yeah. So you know that uh, I you know I think. Uh, it's a work in progress. Long term, yes. Long term, <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah. So uh, this is you know, our, our full chart for how we uh, evaluate. So if it's less than uh, 10,000, it's a no-brainer. We can, we can reach out as they know it will work fine. If it's 10 to 16,000, we have to do a little bit more analysis, you know, uh, um, and uh, uh, eventually we can uh, figure out you know, the, the best, uh, uh, best layout. If it's above 16,000, we have to do a very rigorous analysis. And what it tells us is that, uh, you know the links, the, the uh, four lane roadway? Um, that's not the problem, it's the intersections. So we really have to focus on the intersection and model it, figure out what's going on and how do we make sure that the traffic doesn't uh, break down at the intersection, especially for pedestrians because people are trying to cross and people are being uh, very uh, 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 short, you know, they're uh, trying to make up time. And so, you know, we, uh, so this is, this is our model that we've been doing for a long time. Um, and we get a lot of uh, questions from the merchants, uh, business community, say, hey, you're, you're cutting down the uh, capacity by half, um, and you know, I'm worried about uh, uh, my customers. And you know, uh, we did actually do an inter intercept survey, which we talked to people who were uh, frequenting uh, these uh, neighborhood businesses. And by and large, majority of the people, so these are the people that actually drove there. Majority uh, of the other people were not driving, so it, it, it would open their eyes in terms of their customer base. Um, it's pretty consistent that you know you, you really have to have good environment. People who are walking there, they're that, that's your customer base already. And so if you make it easier, you're going to have a bigger, uh, uh, bigger attraction. And you know why do we do it? It's, it's because safety. I mean, uh, FHWA did a national study, uh, and they said, it's, it's, you know, uh, with all this different data, you know, they definitely say you can reduce collision by 29 percent. That's the minimum. That's what they're saying. Uh, we're seeing a lot higher uh, on a lot of our projects, but uh, um, it is a it's a it's a proven technique. Uh, it's a toolbox that the federal government has endorsed uh, for safety measures. Um, we've been doing this uh, for since 1972. We have about 38 now um, of, of these uh, 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 configuration changes. Uh, we're probably the leader in the nation in terms of uh, uh, making changes on our uh, on our roadway. Um, and how do we identify the, a lot of these? Well, you know, it's because we have this complete street policy. When we have, whenever, whenever we have a overlay project, we go through this checklist. Uh, whenever, whenever we implement a bike uh, project, we go through it. Same with pedestrian uh, improvements. Um, and then we also get community requests. So uh, West Seattle has been very vocal about 35th Street, uh, Roxbury. I mean, these are facilities that are very daunting if you're walking along or trying to cross. Um, Lake City Way, there's many corridors along Lake City Way that has that. Um, and last year, uh, uh, after the unfortunate uh, uh, tragedy, uh, you know, we did a similar treatment on uh, 75th Street. And um, our data, preliminary data, shows that it, exactly what we have experienced. You know, the, the, the safety is improved. We have just as uh, much capacity, if, if not better, on, uh, at the intersections. Um, 
and uh, performance has been just as, as we analyzed. So uh, uh, we feel very confident on these projects. How do, how do you reconcile WatchDot's um, mission, which is really about capacity and throughput, when you have a freeway going through a community like, say, Lake City or Greenwood and other places? How, how does, and especially because you've been in both organizations, yeah. how, do you, how, do you, how do you deal with that? So there, uh, there's a paradigm shift in the state DOT as well. So they wrote, wrote a new chapter uh, for uh, urban areas. It's a context-sensitive uh, design. So it's, it's one of those chicken and egg things that uh, we always grapple with. As an engineer, we, we, you know, we say, oh, I've got to design for what the prevailing speed is. So you measure the speed, 80 percentile speed is 50 miles per hour. So that's the, uh, that's the design speed. Well, if you design it for 25 miles per hour, it's not going to be 50 miles per hour, right? And so um, the concept, context sensitive design is, you know, what is the ideal um, speed of vehicles in that, in that environment? And design your environment so that you get that performance. Um, so the state is, is now adopting that. So they, uh, they, they are uh, on board. Um, the same thing with our crossing. So uh, we, you know, we go out and we count. It's like, well, there's enough people crossing here, so we're not going to mark a crosswalk or a signal. Well, you're not crossing because of six lanes of traffic. Who would, in their right mind, would ever try to cross there, right? And so you would never have a pedestrian facility. Um, so you really have to have community engagement. Say, this is the location where I want to go from this community center to the park to the library. It's like a natural corridor. Mm -hmm. So you have to make the investment to make sure that it's safe and that people use it. I mean, that's, you know, if you build it, people will use it. You have to build it, up, obviously, so that it's safe. Um, so that's the new direction for, uh, for us as traffic engineers, that we don't wait for the collisions. We don't wait for, you know, somebody to get into that awkward situation. We want to design it so that uh, it gets used and that it's safe and that community benefits long term, that we don't get to that zero fatality and serious injuries. So uh, you know, we, uh, we look at uh, uh, you know some safety. We look at collision history. You know those, those locations that have a lot of side swipe, um, angle collisions. You know those are prime candidates. And we have a safety program that we look at uh, every year uh, for all of our system uh, that, that identifies uh, uh, these corridors at intersections and, and, and mid blocks. Um, uh, we look at livability as we change the uh, the speech uh, change, the driver behavior change. And so it actually enhances the, uh, the community. What we hear, go and talk to some of the people on, on uh, 75 we, where, where we just made this change. They'll tell you that it's totally changed that environment on, on, on 75th. It used to be that you don't want to be out there. And now they say it's much easier. People are actually uh, walking and crossing more often. And that's exactly what we're seeing in our data. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, what we normally hear is that, you know, when we do these outreach and say we would like to uh, look at uh, rechannelizing, we get huge amount of, uh, of concern up front. So, 120, uh, 25th, you know, almost 400 people saying, you know, it's like, no way, no how. <laughs> After, uh, it's a very quiet, you know, so it'll pretty much, <laughs> pretty much they see the results. We're not going to satisfy everybody. I mean, that's, that's, that's just how uh, human nature is. Um, but uh, every one of these projects are exactly the same. Uh, we get a huge amount of controversy up front. It's just paint, put it down. People will realize it's not the end of the world, actually it's better. You know? And then they realize, <laughs> you know, I was wrong. Um, and we can now point to these locations where you know, this person was really vehemently opposed and who was actually what, uh, was going to uh, you know, give me a uh, physical harm because you know, he was so angry. <laughs> and then afterwards, and she said, I was, you know, and pretty much said that I, I was wrong and I appreciate you uh, 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 putting up with me. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very rewarding job. <laughs> There's a, a stone way that was done in 2006 uh, where we had to uh, remove a bunch of crosswalks because we had a new uh, federal uh, study that showed that if you mark a crosswalk in inappropriate locations, it actually was more dangerous. Um, so uh, certain volumes and certain configuration, you invited people to cross at a location that was not safe. And so I uh, created a false sense of security and uh, created a multiple threat. And so we removed a large number. And this, this is a corridor where we told the community that we'd come back and take a look at reconfiguring uh, to get the mark, mark crosswalks back. Um, we went from, so 13,000 to an uh, ADT, so average daily traffic, 13,000 vehicles in that corridor. Um, within five blocks of eight schools, Library, side parks, a lot of demand for crossing over there, right? Um, and we removed crosswalks. How do you feel as a traffic engineer? You feel terrible. Um, 
<laughs> no, really. You're, you're isolating this, uh, these uh, communities uh, by doing this. But you don't want to put people in harm's way and mess up the, the other. Uh, so when we, uh, uh, when we went and, uh, and uh, uh, revised, uh, you know, the speed limit is 30, um, the, the 85th percentile is 37, so that's the majority of the people are dri driving 7 miles per hour above, above the speed limit. Afterwards, very modest decrease, 36 northbound, 34 southbound. But you know what? It's these that we're worried about, people who are progressive sp uh, speeders. So people who are going over 10 miles per hour, we had a 75% reduction. The reason why is because if you're the lead car, you control that vehicle behind you. They can't pass you. So you control that aggressive behavior and putting people in harm's way. That's the benefit. So we increased uh, 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 the bicycle travel on that by 35%. Uh, people, uh, and it actually represents a large significant portion of that traffic on there. So it made it easier for people to go. You know, it's like win-win, uh, uh, less people in, in the cars. Yes. What do you think are gonna project like this in the design phase, what is sort of the radius that you have to the community to, to engage the community? Or do you not really? And I'm curious if you want the kind of people whose address is directly off the corridor, yeah. or if there's sort of a, you know... These projects um, take, take a large radius. So uh, when we make... So this is a uh, yeah, freight route. Um, so we're reaching out to Ballard, we're reaching out to Fremont, we're reaching out to Wallingford, uh, Green Lake. Um, it's a it's a broad base uh, reaching out, and when we uh, do the mailers, the first time uh, some people not, might not even be able to read the, uh, uh, what we write, and so we do it in multiple different languages. Um, of course, uh, the people that show up are the the very concerned, and so when we when we have the first meeting, uh, it tends to be very controversial, and uh, uh, so it, it, it tends it tends to. Uh, do the same pattern where uh, uh, we hear the concern and people are venting about the frustration of development and uh, all the things that are happening. Um, and then we just, you know, hear them out. So it's okay, you know, they're worried about cut through traffic. So what we do is we actually measure what the, uh, uh, you know, what the volumes are before and after. We do a rigorous process one year after. Um, in this location, the volumes dropped by 6%, um, and which was kind of consistent with the citywide trend of the volume dropping. But we also, um, Sorry. Um, measure the uh, traffic on the parallel street where people would divert, mm -hmm. and those dropped uh, as well. And so people weren't diverting. Um, so we were very consistent. Saying, here's the data. It's very transparent. You know, uh, we show you what the collision data is, what you know, what the volumes are, and data is not opinion. This data is fact, right? So if a, if a certain amount of vehicles are using that street and they're still using that street. Um, they're not really going anywhere. There. So um, it, it helps us make the case that you know we're being transparent. Here's you know you can actually uh, pull up the data uh, on our website. Um, but this is the reason why we do it. Um, it's because I right hear people who are the most vulnerable. We don't want we don't want people to get hit. And people understand that afterwards. Are there are there holes in the data that you just know by? Uh experience, but can't necessarily have your own data? I'll talk to you about that a little bit on a, another project, which, which is a very good point. Okay. Uh, so uh, Stoneway, you know, we reduced the aggressive speeding, the collisions declined, uh, we have a much better pedestrian crossing, so neighborhood is now connected together, they can get across Aura. Uh, well, we also still get some concern because of, you know, as you saw, the speeding was still 36 miles per hour, right? And so there, there's, there is still so, some of that uh, uh, danger of someone uh, getting, uh, uh, getting into collision with the vehicle. So we're, uh, we're going to be looking at how to address that long term. Um, and, you know, it's really uh, it's showing no impact to the neighborhood streets, so it's uh, all great. Uh, Nickerson Street was another one where we had the same configuration. We changed it to that. Um, and same kind of results. Um, you know, what do we see here? Um, we have, look at this, the aggressive top end speeders, 90, 90, over 90 percent. And I used, this, this was one of the routes I, I routinely took, and I didn't like it, you know, uh, um, and it had that kind of impact. I mean, just, it's just phenomenal. If you think about some of the curves where people are trying to cross, um, it changes the whole environment for you. 
So collisions are down. So this is the, the whole one data. <laughs> so 125th Street, um, which is a uh, from I-5 to Lake City Way, um, it's a major regional uh, route, right? So uh, we did the uh, uh, the change in uh, 2010. Uh, in 2011, uh, the uh, um, uh, 2012, the uh, 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 so December 2011, the uh, tolling went in onto the uh, 520 bridge. Guess what happened? People started using it. <laughs> so we had a lot of diversion uh, at 225th. So before and after, you know, it's, uh, it's just, you know, this looks different, right? Just, just some pain. Uh, it just has a, a very different feel. Um, and it's psychologically, I, I think, drivers respond. Um, I had to testify that it actually works, and I was one of the dissenters. <laughs> <laughs> it works very well, actually. <laughs> so this is this is what we wanted to influence right here, the high-end speeders, right? So we reduced it by 69%, which is good. Um, and the collision rate, now we're reducing collision, but you know, um, you know, and we have more people, you know, crossing, almost a 100% increase in people crossing now because it's much easier to cross. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the Lake City uh, community, the uh, the residents out in that community, the lower income, uh, their uh, immigrant population. They rely on transit, the community center, and the library. That's a very difficult barrier to cross for them, and just made it so much easier for for that access. Um, you know that makes me very uh, humble that I can make you know that kind of change with some striping. Um, yeah, and but Lake City way it goes through there north south. Uh -huh. it's still a we're making it's, changes. It's still really really fast, and so yeah, it, there's a disconnect. No, 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 no. So, so, right now, so right now we have a, a Lake City uh, Safety Corridor uh, project. Nice. Go out on speed now and you'll get pulled over. Nice. Yeah. So, so there's okay. motorcycle police there <laughs> full time. <laughs> so we can make it a toll road, actually. If you just make it a toll road, it'd be really good. <laughs> but we are also doing uh, structural changes on Lake City Way. Uh, so the I-22 next year, we're going to have capital projects, the right size, crossing. 110th, uh, where the pits are crossing, we're going to change that dramatically. 24th, we're going to change. So go out there next year and take a look at it, and, and please uh, let me know. Why are there? all the time. <laughs> I'm just saying. That's great. Yeah. That's good news. So, uh, you know, here's some of the results. I mean, look at that. You know, it's not, you know, it's not dramatic, but it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I wanted uh, to go to the, the whole in data. I'm sorry, the whole, I wanted to answer the whole in data. Uh, so you know, we rely on uh, police reports, right? So if someone does get into a fender bender and decide to you know, uh, not report, we don't get that. Um, if someone uh, gets in a bike collision and they don't get an ambulance, uh, then we don't get that. So there is a uh, fixed set of data that we don't get before and after. So uh, for us, it's uh, neutral. Uh, if we didn't get it before and we get it after, uh, then uh, it shouldn't change the results. Uh, but we are now using uh, fire response. So any, anytime an ambulance comes, we're using that data to overlay to the entire city. And what we're getting is the falls on uh, trails. We're getting falls on sidewalks. And so those are locations that now we're saying, okay, there's something going on at this location that isn't vehicle related, but it, May be you know may have some structural issues with that uh, systemic uh, uh, risk that we want to address. How about yeah. trolley tracks? Trolley track definitely yes, and that 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 is one I of the challenges. One of those. Yes, so I, I fell on a on a yeah. street okay. <laughs> track. And you know how to feel. Yes, it's just very sudden. I mean, it, it, and it it, it, it is a, a, a unexpected uh, uh, fall. So uh, this is kind of a funny uh, funny one that I want to talk to you about. So. Uh, what, what is the, the most lively and uh, uh, connected uh, location in the city of Seattle where we see the most pedestrians? Pike Place. Pike Place. Um, so Pike Place Market is, is a, you know, a pedestrian dominated street, right? You guys have walked in there. Cars are allowed, right? But you know, they're not going very fast, right? They can't right? possibly go. Yeah. And then this beautiful overlook, Victor Steinberg Park, is, uh, is uh, divided by Western Avenue, right? So mass of people. And you know some people who are not quite uh, um, mentally able to understand the dangers. Uh, so you know there's fun, you know activities that are happening. You know, so uh, I was asked, you know, as a news traffic engineer, you got to fix this. You know, this is this is a a uh, uh, someone's going to get killed soon. So 
you know, this is not always stop. You know, this was a, this is chaos. You know, uh, please fix this before someone is killed. Uh, that was a resounding from Pike Place Market. Uh, uh, there was a uh, a co-op, a preschool. Uh, you know, so I said, okay, I'll I'll, I'll come out and take a look at this. You know, so and you see the vibrancy here. You got all these cars. You know, first looks like my God, someone is gonna get killed here. No one's gonna look, right? So you know, I'm gonna have to t look at the data and see what the data shows. This is why the data is so important. Okay, I'm sorry about this the walkiness here, but uh, it's hard to read. Um, so this is the intersection, and these are the turning movement counts. So th th these are the turning cars, 69 in an hour, 60 this way, um, 151 through, and uh, uh, 36 turning right. So there's 365, uh, 3,655 cars going through this way, 5,372 this way. Uh, so it kind of gives you a relative uh, what the volume is. It's about you know 10,000 or so uh, going to Western Avenue, um, and then these are the pedestrians. So there's 2,592 people crossing this way, 538. This is this is one hour, okay? Uh, 509. <laughs> so pretty much pedestrian. It says to me this is pedestrians. This is not cars. This is, this is people, okay? Uh, I looked at the 10 years data and said, okay, we had um, uh, 10 collisions. Uh, how many collisions is there? Uh, I think it was 10 collisions. Um, so there was seven, uh, 17 collisions approach, um, there was 26 collisions approach, these are rear, rear engines and parked cars, uh, seven collisions going down the hill here. Um, at this intersection there was two collisions, one was a damage to a parked car and one rear end, in 10 years. So someone had somebody in, and then someone had a parked car. <laughs> Safest location that I could ever point to, and here's a count we had on uh, tw uh, July of 2011, 3,600, I, I feel sorry for the person that counted this, uh, 39 <laughs> people crossing, and uh, we had 571 vehicles crossing. So we have the most safest condition possible with such vibrancy, and this is what what the traffic control, if, yeah. that I would have done if I, if I, if I would have followed the request. They wanted a traffic signal, so always stop, prioritize pedestrians, right? So if you always stop, you just set down, right? You have, cars have to stop, right? Low speeds, right? So if you're stopping, you're not going to be going very fast at all. And so pretty much cars are looking out for pedestrians. Pedestrians don't have to wait, you know, they can go any which way. Uh, as soon as you put in a signal, what happens? You're stopped, right? So people start backing up into the, into the, if you look at the sidewalk, it's very narrow, right? So if you think about the number of people in there, now we gotta start picking out stalls and making this big landing area. As soon as the green light turns, what happens? You got a queue of cars, now a platoon of cars going through, 20, 30 miles per hour. If someone steps out, what happens? It's pretty tragic, right? So I saw that and I said, this is not something that I can, you know, in good conscience uh, support. So I went to the historical commission and said, you know, this is what the data shows. You know, they, they've been asking for a signal forever, you know, so um, I took a hard look at it and said, you decide, but you know, I uh, cannot and I would resign if I, if I, if I would. <laughs> no, really, because I would, I, I would, I don't think I could, uh, I could do that and be able to uh, say that I uh, serve the public. And they agreed after, after looking at the data, but the data is what's, what was needed, because everybody's perception is, is really bad, but once you show the data and you go out there and look at it, it's like, you know, it's really safe. And then you go to uh, one uh, intersection over to First and Pike, and it's a very different environment. You go in there and it's, it has an all-way walk, but it feels so much different. You don't want to be walking out there. It just feels like, you know, it, it, uh, uncomfortable, right? So you're really on, the, on guard watching out. Um, so I, I say to you as uh, professionals, as you, as, you, as you look at the park environment, you, know, you got to take that psychological approach, but use data, because data is, shows you what the critical issues are and how, you know, how, to, how to solve it, and how, not, not to repeat some of the things that uh, can create the same, same problems over and over again. And the reason why the traffic engineering profession is so bad is because we looked at vehicle level service. We wanted to, vehicle level, delay is bad, right? So, Wider, wider uh, turn lanes, accommodate as much as car as possible, uh, faster speed. But what does that do for the drivers and what does that do for the pedestrians? Uh, it's totally opposite of what we want in an urban environment. 40th Street, this is a just done. So I encourage you to go out and take a look at it. So this is a, 
University of Washington, 15th Avenue is a major bus corridor, uh, University um, and Brooklyn. So this is uh, Terran Manor Hall, which is all kind of being redeveloped. Uh, this is all huge. Uh, Mercer Development got to, you know, that's where I live and I went to school. And I don't recognize it because it's, <laughs> it's shiny and uh, very nice. Um, so students coming to the U and they want to get to the campus, you know, this is a natural uh, pathway, right, to George Washington Boulevard there. Um, and so, you know, uh, we had an opportunity uh, um, uh, from the residents, so uh, 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 University of Green Bay folks, you know, they said 40th quarter is a pretty good quarter for people, prioritizing people, uh, so, you know, please take a look at it. They gave us a report last year. Um, John Cooper came in for the uh, urban, uh, Urbanism Symposium, and we were trying to do something very modest, you know, maybe some intersection painting or something like that. Um, but we came out with this design um, after just looking at it. So uh, our, I have the best um, technical staff ever. I mean, uh, they're awesome. So they came up with this design, which is, uh, well, I'll show you. So uh, uh, we had parking on the side, um, and, uh, 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 really wide lane, so I can see the remnants of the, the bike lane here, the bike lane on this side. We just reconfigured it, so they put the bike lanes on the south side. I put a little buffer in, and I want to show you the difference. So this is this intersection right here, looking up the hill, you can see the bike lane, bike lane, uh, big wide lanes, and parking. This is an all-way stop um, right on Brooklyn. Going up the hill, there's the uh, uh, College and Pub right there, uh, traffic signal right there. Um, this is the afterwards, so we repaved it because the pavement condition is really bad. Um, we paved it, um, and look, we just put some uh, linear posts in here. Uh, you know, it's an always stop, so very safe, right? Um, so we, there's a preschool here as well, and, uh, right, right on campus, um, and they probably will walk. So um, this, uh, be, if we long term, <laughs> uh, could be a route that kids might be able to use as they get more experience. But so, so that's that's kind of the goal. This is the uh, this is the location where uh, this photo was taken so before and after. So just one question. So you made the one-way bike lanes a two-way bike lane? That's yes, so we, we consolidated the bike lanes to one side. Now you have this 12-foot to 10-foot uh, bike space, but two-foot buffer. Uh, and all we did was we uh, put the buffer in with some paint, and we put some posts in. Uh, we want to see how it works. If it works really well, we can make this permanent and put some seat curbing in there. I mean, there's a lot of different things we can do, but we want to do very low cost. This is pain, right? So uh, pretty low cost. But the dramatic thing that we did is, remember the signal? And what we talked about at Pike Place? Well, this location, majority of the people that were using it wasn't part. It was, it was, it was students crossing to get, get to school. So it wasn't serving the pedestrians very well. We did an analysis and the vehicle volumes are really low. And so we made that same environment where uh, they were asking us to put in, we have it here at, uh, at Pike Place. So we made it an always stop. Put it in, boom. And uh, tremendous change. I mean, the, the, the whole environment, the speeds are so much lower. The whole environment is different at this location. So collagen, um, uh, after we made the change, you know, they, they wanted uh, parking. Now they're, um, uh, last week when we talked to them, you know, they want some on-street bike crowds. So, you know, people see, you know, the kind of the, once it's in place, they see the, the possibilities. They see the, that, you know, really one car versus, you know, 12 bikes, you know, that can park there. Uh, that's, and it's, it's a college gym, right? So you get a beer, <laughs> get, get the coffee, you know, so it's... <laughs> Is so, the bike turn movement fairly safe? So it's an always stop. So you stop, and then you know, okay. you know, hopefully stay once you stop. <laughs> oh, and the uh, you can see right here at the uh, uh, 15th, which is uh, this location right here. Uh, it's the main entrance to the campus, right? And so you can see the buses lining up, and we got the mass of pedestrians crossing. It's a two-phase signal, meaning that it's green this way and green this way. So when it's green this way, all the people cross, and. If you're a student, you're gonna cross even on the solid dome walk. So that poor bus has to go through on the red. So we get one car through per cycle. And this left, the same thing, right? So hitting this left, you know, this, this left, same thing. So what we did there was uh, put in a all-way walk. And this is what happened after we put the, students are very smart. They figured out right away, oh look, no one else is going, I'm gonna go diagonally. 
So now it becomes <laughs> almost a pipe place, but controlled pipe place uh, that we create this nice pedestrian corridor. Very low, I mean, this is just some signs and a little programming on the on a computer. And we did the analysis. Um, there was a lot of concerns about, oh, you know, people won't, won't understand. There's all this, you know, people are smart. They'll, they'll figure it out. And that's what, exactly what happened uh, uh, at this location. So think about, you know, in your work, you know, little subtle things that can change that paradigm. How do you get people across to where you need to go? Um, and then this is uh, Woodland Park. Um, Goes under the bridge there, under Aura. Uh, before there was no no sidewalks. This was this was a you know, kind of a no man's land. People used to just uh, speed right through. We put an all way stop here. Put a crosswalk in. Uh, nice sidewalks. Thank you, Parks, for uh, <laughs> transferring the the right of way so we could do this over here. So much. I mean, think about what it looks like here in crossing, and now what it looks like right here in crossing. The other thing that we did is you see these little bumps right here. So this is we always get criticized uh, for. Your marking is never visible. Well, you know those markings that uh, uh, we put down is paint. The same paint that uh, you paint your house with. <laughs> and a couple buses go over it and it's pretty much it fades right away, right? So it's very environmentally friendly because it's waterborne. Uh, but not the most safe uh, situation where you have to paint multiple times. So you, know, uh, you have to close impact traffic. Um, so we put down this is called an epoxy uh, methamphetamine. It's the same stuff that you see on the freeway. Mm -hmm. um, it all lasts 10 years or more. And you build these bumps in by just putting the hopper in and putting a little more material in. You know what that does? Before, as a driver goes through at 35, they just hug that corner, they go right over that pump. You know what happens when they do that this, this time? They go over this little rumble part and they could hear. <clears throat> And they actually break. You can see that happening where a, a car will break because they, they don't like that. They don't like hear that. Um, I learned this trick from Everett where we did the exact same thing on Mokotio Boulevard where we skinny the lane down to 11 feet because we had 14, 15 feet lanes and people were speeding through. We skinny it down and put these little wide rumble bars and it decreased the speed by 5 miles per hour just by striking. Physical, psychological change. Uh, this is the kind of the part that I really like. So I, I, I just learned so much from other people. So we went to Vancouver and Bryce, went there. Um, amazing city. Um, I wouldn't move there except that <laughs> I want to make, make what they have here, which is they have a community that's built for people. They have places where you work and then places where you can recreate and where you can play, where you can hang out and have uh, family time. And here's how they do it. You know, they create streets that are very, you know, used to be very much a nuisance to this vibrant, you know, who wouldn't want to be hanging out right here? It's a street end. It, they, they created a less greenery. They have volunteers that will maintain this. <laughs> so, Don, you, you talk about, uh, do we have that built-in base? I think we do. Because, um, so, in, in Vancouver, they have 500 volunteers that uh, sign up for these. Um, you know, they make these very low cost improvements. You know, they actually put benches in, which is very uh, uh, friendly to older people. As our population gets older, we need to do more of that. Um, but in Seattle, this is what we do. We put these traffic circles in the middle of nowhere. Who does that serve? So someone actually puts a uh, boat in there. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fun. I would love to climb that tree and, you know, it's like, uh, so, I'm sorry, but uh, so I'm a little jaded in that uh, the way our profession, my department, uh, 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 the way that we uh, address the needs of the community was totally backwards. So I'm sorry about that. But, uh, uh, so we have 1,500 traffic circles and almost double the volunteers in Seattle. We already have it. So I, we just need to rechange our program so that we can have what Vancouver has double fold. And people care. I mean, Lake City. Oh, that's Andy's curtain. Yeah, let's see, look at that. I mean, this is, you know, it's amazing. I, I walked through there and I was like totally blown away. I was like, wow, look at this beautiful garden. I that's my wife's garden. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> very lush, you know, this very, you know, it's like, let's, let's do more of this in a way that people can use it. And of course, we have great partners in SPU. Uh, you know, we want to have environmental friendly. Uh, 
So, uh, you know, we can do designs that, you know, just wows people, uh, that, you know, creates this uh, amenity that people want to be in. Uh, so this is uh, North, North Seattle. And then London Avenue, a very expensive, but transformative project on this complete street. Um, it, it, before, you didn't want to cross there or walk along there. Now, it's like you want to sit in the middle of it. <laughs> I mean, it, it is really nice. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, 14th Avenue, which uh, uh, we're working with Parks on. Uh, again, it's a community-driven process. We want to create that Vancouver model. We want to create this space where people want to be and hang out and have your kids learn how to ride your bike on this linear park. It used to be an old trolley right, uh, right away. Very wide, high speeds. Uh, no reason for that. Uh, um, and we want to transform it so that it's an amenity rather than a distraction of the community. And we need to uh, really highlight and get the data and show people what the difference is, what the value of their property, uh, how that changes because of this amenity. Uh, people think, I lose parking, you know, it's going to be less convenient. But you get this wonderful space to come out and have dinner, have a picnic. So let's, you know, let's work together and change the region. Thank you. Yeah, one more back to the state. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you collecting any data on like the last picture you showed where you take a uh, wide street with high speeds and then there's a trolley and you said, yeah, taking any data on the after effects such as uh, the amount of stormwater uh, retention, detention that's occurring, and um, you know some of the environmental benefits versus the the gray grayscape versus the, the landscape. Yeah. So uh, SPU uh, has that uh, expertise, but not I. <laughs> but I do have the ability to measure volumes on the street, collision of street, the behavior. We're actually going to change. So that street that you saw is 30 miles per hour. It's a minor arterial street. Uh, doesn't need to be an arterial street, so we're going to change it to a 20 mile per hour facility, narrow the roadway down, um, put in <coughs> raised intersections. So the whole intersection will be closed now, becomes this continuous park. I mean, we, we can do these little small things and we can create this incredible space for people to gather around um, rather than this barrier. So, uh, harder to uh, gauge that. I think we need to do a better job of maybe uh, surveying the residents before and after. Um, so that uh, we get get that data point to show others, so that we can do more of them. Yes, ma'am. So Sandpoint Way here is actually quite dangerous. It is. is. There's no sidewalk for a large part of it, and uh, during the the summer type months, uh, there are uh, cars with boat trailers, you know, that they're towing to, to go down to the 66th Street ramp. And also, the park has become so busy with events uh, many months of the year now that there's not adequate parking. So, what would be your solution for Sandpoint Way and Magnuson Park and other regional parks oh, yeah. in the city as well? So, great question. I appreciate that. Um, so, Sandpoint Way is way over designed. It used to be a, a state highway, still is, but unfortunately, it is a state highway. Um, it's designed for highway standards. It is not functioning as a highway and should not be, uh, so we should not accept that. Um, that space can be used for a walking route. Or we can repurpose it very easily. So you see what uh, Seattle Children's Hospital did in front of their uh, uh, campus? They have a very wide sidewalk with some different pavement for the, where the bicycle should be. And it's a location where you feel totally safe. So if you wanted to go three miles, you know, you could, you you'd probably take take that if it was all the way to Madison Park. Uh, same thing. So our, you know, uh, the tools that we had in the past was you know paint some uh, uh, lines on the street and hopefully people will use it. Uh, what we found out is that people will use it. You know, people who used it would have used it anyways because they're confident riders. Um, <coughs> and so Berkham and Trails right there. I mean, that's a regional route, and that connection from the trail to the park is pretty darn hairy. There's not very good uh, access. And so when we did the bicycle facility uh, on uh, 65th, uh, we made a considered effort to make it safer. And so we put some 
very ugly looking, and I apologize to the neighborhood and also to the parks community that uh, there are metal barriers, zipper barriers that we salvaged from the Spokane Street Viaduct. It makes it look like, look like a highway, and it's totally opposite of what we want. We want it more inviting, more green. Um, but it was a tool that we had available, and we plunked it down, and it was a very big mistake. Um, but totally safe. If you were in there, uh, you don't have to worry about a car coming in because that car would be bounced off, and um, they would be they they would be uh, not a, not even a factor. Uh, what we didn't do very well there is the crossing at San Point. So we have to do a better job of crossing the arterial streets, and making sure that everybody knows that it's a safe crossing. Exactly what we did on University uh, and 40th, and exactly what we did on 15th. We're going to try to do more and more of on all of our arterial streets. Um, and I have to be very honest that uh, um, some of the tools that, that we like to use is not available to us because um, there's some older engineers uh, that set the standard for the, uh, for the industry. And that standard is in the way for us to implement because if there is, so our, our state is uh, joint civil liability, meaning that if someone does get hurt, uh, that person could be drunk and texting and they ran over somebody and that person is hurt, and the, that person says, I need, to, um, I need resources so I can survive. Um, so they uh, point to the city, they point to the drunk driver, and the city put in a, a device that was you know, not, uh, not in the standard. And so they say, you know, because of that, um, you know, the jury might say that the you know, city might be 1% at fault. You know, maybe, maybe that drunk driver could have recognized it and, and stopped in time if we would have used a different, different uh, uh, uniform standard, right? And so, um, because joint civil liability means that that person has to be made whole, um, that person doesn't have insurance, so you know, the city, you as taxpayer, has to pay for that full recovery for that person. Um, so my job, because I represent the entire city, I have to look at that risk and make sure that the risk that we take is appropriate and I can defend it. So there's multiple stakeholders that I have to make sure that agree with me when I, when I use these tools. That's why I get the community always asking for these things, and I want to provide it so much, but um, I have to have all the data. It's not the data, right? I have to have that data to show this is why we're using this device. We have 20 years of history. Just says it's safer. Prove me wrong. And they can't because I have the data. Uh, but if I use a new device and I have no data to back up, then we, we um, are at risk. So I want to make sure that I don't put the city at risk because I want to make sure that the things that we do is progressive enough that we can deploy in a national level. The, the, I mean, you it stopped at 65th, right? There's also this whole span actually where we are now that goes all the way down to Noah Road, right? And so that's actually the whole span, span of the park yeah. in terms of usage. So is there any plan to do more of that? And again, as an example of how we treat the regional parks where a lot of people are trying to Yes, absolutely. I mean, those are the critical things that are barriers. That's why people drive, right? Because they don't, want, they don't, they don't want, they, they can't get that last mile uh, where it's, it's comfort, comfortable and safe. So we need to concentrate our resources to to make those connections safe. And uh, uh, we, we'll be working with parks. We'll be working with uh, uh, SPU uh, uh, with you because uh, uh, you, you're the experts. You know, you know, you know these facilities. You use it all the time. You know where the challenges are. And you need to let us know how we can uh, address them. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm just curious to talk a little bit about speed bumps versus other tools that I've seen deployed around okay. the city. They seem really kind of slapdash in terms of like different approaches here yeah. and there. And I'm talking more about the neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, Believe it or not, there is a uh, comprehensive program and a very reasoned approach for all of them. Um, so uh, the reason why we have so many traffic circles is because traffic circles are based on collisions. So people, you know, as the volumes increase, people do the cut through. Um, you get the right angle collisions because of the frequency. So you put this traffic circle on there, and now you can't get that right angle collision. It's, you know, it's very much, you know, you have to slow down. Uh, it solves it, but it makes it worse for pedestrians because now the cars are always coming around where the pedestrians are crossing. So it's not a tool that we want to deploy anymore on facilities where people are walking Part of time. But this collision is still a tool, but okay? it's, it's something that I feel is uh, uh, not appropriate. I'd rather put it on the sidewalk space where the, uh, people have more visibility, and then when you're turning, you know, that it, it's, so, it's, it's much more, more than just the, the vehicle uh, fix. Um, 
what you're seeing is speed humps. I mean, speed, uh, I would say we have one of the most progressive fire departments uh, in the region. Um, so I work with our deputy uh, fire chief um, on all these projects. There are, so our streets are very darn narrow. If you try to take a fire engine through those, it's darn impossible. And so as our population gets older, we're going to have a lot more emergencies to respond to, you know, medical uh, issues, right? Or for, for if there is a fire. So we want to make sure that they have, you know, good access from our arterial street to a secondary uh, network to that, uh, to the person that needs the help. And so uh, we have a, a comprehensive grid of response routes that we are very protective of. Um, and we don't put any physical device in those locations and we try to address it in other, other ways. Other locations, not as critical ones, so those are the locations that we're focusing on. Uh, we did try some locations where uh, kids are at risk, so in front of schools that are on Charles streets. And so we, the first thing that we do is we try to put some signs up, you know, your speed is, you know, that's pretty effective. You get the, you know, uh, person that's not paying attention, they're going 20 miles over, they'll slow down, or a second car might slow down, and so it'll control the platoon depending on the configuration. But certain locations, you physically need to put some sort of device to control that speed. Our neighborhood greenway is designed, designed that way. So that if you're driving 30 miles per hour on a residential street where kids are walking, um, you have that first bump and then you're not going to go anymore cause, because that impact is such that um, it's going to change your behavior. And then if you're, if you're using that route as a cutthroat route, then it's not going to be a attractive route because you're not going to have that fast speed. So um, we're deploying them on these uh, locations that are prioritized for uh, pedestrian bike. We put stop signs on the, the crossing street so that if you're on a bicycle, you know that cars will stop for you. Um, we put uh, uh, the, the best tool that we have available at the arterial crossing. I still think that we need to do more, and uh, we will be getting there uh, so that the arterial crossing uh, is much easier. Um, and then we're monitoring the usage along, along that corridor because we want low, pretty much just local traffic rather than people cutting through, right? So. Um, uh, so that's the approach, you know, uh, some of the devices you see, they're, you know, the, the rubber kind, that's the temporary, you know, uh, what the fire department says, yeah, okay, we understand there's a need, go and try it out, it, it has a lifespan and it'll go away, and so that's what, that's what you're seeing. They get so many bumps and then they start lifting out, so we remove them, and, you know, it addresses that immediate concern from the residents, we saw some data, so, you know, we'll go and measure it out again and see if there's a change in behavior. Um, so that's sort of the tool, long term, I would love to narrow the roadway, <laughs> you know, just physically, environmentally, if you have all these overhangs of you know, greenery, you don't want to be going very fast because there's all, all this vibrancy. That's what we want. We want this urban set, urban areas where people are, are wanting the outside, right? So, um, um, real quick question about trees. I, I know that Bill Ames and, and, and others at SDOT, you know, that you have a target for canopy cover for the city that we're aiming at. And one of the things that's sort of interesting is that um, a number of years ago when, when WashDOT put the corridor through Lake City Way, uh, they denied use of trees. And, and, I, and I can imagine all sorts of engineering reasons why. So my question to you, um, general and specific, is um, are those um, standards relaxing? And specifically along Lake City Way, we already have a median where trees can go in. And can we get trees? Yes, you can. Um, the reason why is because the state says you buy the liability, and the city says we will buy the liability. Um, uh, we say that um, on uh, our urban environment, the curb is the clear zone. You don't want any cars going beyond the cur uh, curb and then recovering in the sidewalk space to get back on the road. We want you to stop at the curb if, you, if you're going over. We want, we want you to hit that telephone pole and not hit somebody else. Uh, so, fixed object, trees, it's great, uh, it provides that protection for the most vulnerable users. In the median space, it uh, provides a canopy, right, so it's not this clear, clear view. We want, we want that. Okay. Um, so, yes, definitely. And is that going to be a subject of the quarter study, or how do we have access to the quarter study? And it's happening um, right now, so you need to get involved. We've been doing this for a little over a year now, so the, mm -hmm. the, the Lake City community, um, in the inception, uh, in the Mayor McGinn's, uh, it, it was my uh, uh, weekly meeting with me, so I was, uh, yeah. I was out there fairly, fairly frequently. Um, so um, right now, so we identified all the, uh, all the concerns, uh, walked the corridor with uh, many of the residents. 30th Street was one where you know, there was a lot, lot of need, so we're actually putting sidewalks through there, nice crossing for, uh, 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 for the community to get, get across. So those are things that are happening. 
Um, and then there's all the other things that we identified based on data. You know, these are where the locations where people are having trouble, and so we're uh, addressing those uh, based on data. Uh, so we have uh, funding, we have projects, real things happening. Uh, uh, they'll be in design right now, and they'll, they'll go to construction next year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.